This program has been selected by Canada 125 as part of Canada's official anniversary celebrations and was made possible by Eaton's, Canada's department store since 1869, Confederation Life, serving people's financial needs since 1871, and Knob Hill Farms, the food terminal, a proud Canadian company. You are the brightness of the sunshine That lights up my room You are the warmth of the water That washes me each day You are the strength That fills me when my weakness overflows You are the comfort of a soothing word when the heart is feeling low like the light that brings me home when I've lost my way the inspiration that I need when I face another day you're the joy to On Top of the World Canada. Despite the vast distances, climatic extremes and six time zones, we have attempted in this one hour travel documentary to capture the immensity, the beauty and diversity of Canada. Our journey took us into every province and territory. After the last ice age, Homo sapiens migrated from their tropical homelands, some moving to northwestern Eurasia becoming the ancestors of the Europeans, others over the Bering Strait to become the aboriginals of the New World. About 905 AD, the descendants of these two peoples met in what today is Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, people ignore uh, this fact that uh, the Vikings were in Canada 500 years before Columbus. And they generally ignore this by saying, well, nothing came from the, the Norse. Uh, they tried to put in a colony and the uh, native peoples chased them away and that was the end of it. But the Norse did establish colonies in Greenland. And these weren't small colonies. There were 3,000, 4,000, maybe 5,000 Norsemen living in Greenland for 500 years. Uh, there's no wood in Greenland, and wood is really necessary for building uh, farms and ships and so on. Uh, there were lovely spruce forests, a couple of days' sail from Greenland and Labrador. And another reason that they were coming to Canada was to trade, mainly to trade with the Inuit, uh, because the Norse needed walrus ivory. That was their big currency uh, in Europe. The archaeological site at Lanso Meadow in Newfoundland revealed definite proof of the Viking presence in Canada. It is now believed that fishermen from Portugal and England were sailing here as early as 1450. So when Italian explorer Giovanni Cabotto, better known as John Cabot, made his so-called discovery of Newfoundland, he was really following the instructions of those who sailed before him. Unlike the Vikings who came for ivory and wood, the 15th century European explorer was interested in another commodity. They say that Cabot's men went back stating that there was so much fish in the waters that they found it difficult to navigate. Now, the big question comes up, is fish big deal? What was so important about fish? But if you went back to the grocery bills of the day, you would find that more was paid for dried salt cod than for any other commodity. And the other thing to remember is that it wasn't just the English, it was the French and the Spanish and the Dutch and Portuguese who also discovered this fishery. By 1525, there were so many ships in St. John's Harbor that uh, Captain John Ross wrote a letter to King Henry to say, there are ships here of all nations. If you don't soon send an official settlement to this place, you're going to lose your hold on the newfound land. And in 1527, the Butte family were sent out to settle St. John's, which was a long time ago. And it also gives us the right to claim the oldest community in North America. 
St John's has an aura. It has a feeling about it that only evolves, I think, after years and years of people being there. And there's a, an at-homeness, a coziness about St John's. Uh, the houses are wonderful. The colours that they're painted are brilliant. And, uh, you know, we joke about it. People say, why do, why do uh, townies paint their houses such bright colours? And we always say, so we can find them in the fog. <laughs> <laughs> The people of Newfoundland are a distinct breed, a warm, hospitable people with a unique zest for life. And so I couldn't resist asking Regina how they felt about the infamous Newfie jokes. Let me tell you about the Newfie jokes. We make them up. <laughs> Furthermore, we write them down in these little Newfie joke books and we sell them to the mainlanders and we laugh all the way to the bank. And we keep them right simple so they can understand them. <laughs> Nova Scotia, the very name conjures up images of rugged highlands and the sounds of bagpipes, lobster traps and Peggy's Cove. But before the Scottish Highlanders fled here, there were the native Mi'kmaq Indians, the British, the French and loyalists from the American colonies, all of whom have left an indelible stamp on this province. This is the fortress of Louisbourg, just outside of Sydney, Nova Scotia, built on the Cape Breton coast. It was built to guard the Gulf of St. Lawrence and protect France's dwindling empire in the New World. The control of Louisbourg went back and forth between the French and English until finally England decided to build its own garrison, Halifax. After the American Revolution, Thousands of supporters of the British cause, the United Empire Loyalists, resettled in Nova Scotia. While many of these Loyalists were white Americans of British descent, others were Huguenots, Dutch, Germans, English Quakers and ex-slaves. And because of Canada's anti-slavery legislation, many blacks sought refuge here before the Civil War. The year was 1783 and the multicultural pattern of Canadian immigration had begun. Although Nova Scotia's maritime past has become a tourist attraction, I was delighted to find that landmarks such as Peggy's Cove, Lunenburg and the Cabot Trail have been preserved in their natural beauty and splendour. The striking feature of the Rocks Provincial Park are these top-heavy formations of soft rock, resembling huge flower pots at the mouth of the Petticodiac River in New Brunswick. The reddish pillars are formed by the 14-metre tides that surge up the Bay of Fundy. At high tide, the tips of these flower pots become small islands. At nearby Fundy National Park, I met Rob Walker. Fundy is hill country. Uh, hills going up to 366 uh, meters or 1,200 feet above sea level. So all of Fundy is uh, rugged topography, uh, steep hills, uh, deep river valleys, fast flowing rivers, waterfalls, all going down to the uh, Bay of Fundy shoreline.
My next stop in New Brunswick was Mary's Point Shorebird Reserve. Birds that are passing through here uh, on their migration south. When they have completed their uh, nesting um, in the uh, Arctic, then they pass through here in hundreds of thousands. We call them sandpipers, but there are about 10 different species of those birds. They stop for about 10 days and they feed and they get fed and they fuel up because then from here, right from this point, they fly from 40 to 60 hours non-stop to South America. Listening to the birds, I could understand how the nearby Tantramar marshes got their name. From the French, Tintamar, meaning loud noise. These marshes, called the world's biggest hayfield, are protected from the sea by dikes built by 17th century Acadian settlers. Prince Edward Island is Canada's smallest and most densely populated province. And it was here in the capital city of Charlottetown that Confederation was conceived. The concept of federation between the colonies had been proposed since the end of the 18th century. It was argued that an economic and political union would facilitate the building of a transcontinental railroad. The railroad would be key in the future development of the country, vital to trade and western settlement, not to mention fatten the pocketbooks of speculators and politicians. But perhaps the most compelling argument for a union was to create a unified defense against the growing threat of an American military takeover. In 1864, Upper and Lower Canada learned that the Atlantic provinces wanted to form their own maritime union. So a delegation, including John A. Macdonald and George Brown, was quickly assembled. They boarded the Queen Victoria, loaded with $13,000 worth of champagne, and set sail for Prince Edward Island, where they were met by a single oyster boat. It seems their arrival was eclipsed by the first ever visit of the circus. Despite their low-key welcome, the Ottawa delegation persevered and delivered a series of brilliant speeches about a unified nation under a central government, able to defend herself from all aggressors. That evening, the Ottawa delegates hosted a dinner party for the Maritimes' representatives aboard the Queen Victoria. George Brown described that fateful night in a letter to his wife. The ice became completely broken. The tongues of the delegates wagged merrily, and the bands of matrimony between all the provinces of British North America had been formally proclaimed. The best way to experience both the naturalist soar at the creation of the dunes and the comfort of one of the finest beaches in North America is here in Prince Edward Island's National Park. Every summer, over a million visitors come to sun, swim, and explore. Many of them will make the pilgrimage to Green Gables, the house that inspired Lucy Maud Montgomery's classic, Anne of Green Gables. Ice cream. It's marvelous and mysterious. Ice cream! <laughs> Her mother died when she was 22 months old. And then from there, she was taken down to her Cavendish home and raised by her grandparents, the McNeils, down in uh, Cavendish. And what I always argue, that she had to have that loneliness in Cavendish to write. And people have said they'd see her at 3 or 4 in the morning roaming the fields. I suppose she's getting books put together and characters thought out. Well, I think Anne, is, as Lucy Maud says herself, is her imagination, based on certain real things that happened to her in her life. But Anne is a creation of Lucy Maud Montgomery's mind. Prince Edward Island is really a beautiful province, the most beautiful place in America, I believe. Elsewhere are more lavish landscapes and grander scenery, but for chaste, restful loveliness, it is unsurpassed. Compassed by the inviolate sea, it floats on the waves of the Blue Gulf, a green seclusion and haunt of ancient peace.
Leaving the Maritimes, we travelled west to the industrial, political and financial heartbeat of the country, Central Canada. 62% of the country's population resides in the region, which is made up of two provinces, Ontario and Quebec. We began this leg of the journey in a city renowned for its joie de vivre, Montreal. Quebec's predominantly French-speaking population, combined with its North American lifestyle, gives Montreal and the province an ambiance that can be found nowhere else. Quebec City, the capital, was recognized as a World Heritage Site in 1985 due to its extraordinary wealth of 17th and 18th century architecture. Although most Canadians are urban dwellers, the wilderness is virtually an hour's drive away, no matter where you live. En route to Ottawa, we stopped by in the Laurentians. This was Bytown in the mid-1800s, the most notorious work camp in North America. Lumber was king, and the lumbermen spent their recreational hours in drunken bouts of fist fights and eye gouging. So just imagine the reaction from Montreal, Toronto, Kingston, and other contenders when, in 1857, Queen Victoria chose this town, renamed Ottawa, to be the capital of Canada. We're standing here on a very special place in the heart of the capital, and we're surrounded by Canada's history and by Canada's symbols. Behind us here, we see the Parliament of Canada. This is where 295 people come to make the laws for every inch of this country. Next to it, you see the Supreme Court of Canada. It is a place where, under our constitutional laws, every Canadian citizen is protected. Across the river in Hull, Quebec, is the Museum of Civilization. Its mandate is to capture the threads of this country going back to the last ice age. We left Ottawa and travelled south. Ontario has a variety of landscapes, climates and diversions that make it the country's most visited province. The northern wilderness, the honeymoon capital of the world, Niagara Falls, and the cultural and cosmopolitan attractions of Toronto. One of the most beautiful places to see the fall colours is Algonquin Park, about a three-hour drive north of Toronto. This wilderness has inspired many creative souls, including Tom Thompson and the Group of Seven, an art movement of the 1920s that dared to paint Canadian landscapes in a Canadian style. Fellow painter Arthur Limser called Thompson the voyageur, the discoverer, he felt nature, he adored her, crept into her moods, and his canvases lived in the Canadian mind. Barely two months later, 
Ontario is transformed into a winter wonderland. As we continued across Canada, we traveled west and then north. There are no roads leading to the next stop of our journey. The only way to get there is by plane or by train. Founded in the 1700s, Churchill, Manitoba is Canada's only Arctic seaport and polar bear capital of the world. In my quest for caribou and polar bears, I experienced the tundra buggy, an unusual form of transportation. These huge buggies stick to bumpy 20-year-old trails to avoid further damage to the environment. The tundra is extremely fragile. There is only about six inches of soil above the bedrock, and yet it supports over 200 different species of plants. The essence of both the wildlife and Inuit lifestyle is captured by carvers like Camila Iqulut in beautiful soapstone carvings. For over 6,000 years, people have been meeting at the forks. Native families once hunted, fished and traded in the area. Later, French traders and explorers came to the junction of the Red and Assiniboine rivers in search of furs. Scottish and Métis settlers established the Red River settlement here in the early part of the 19th century during the conflict between the Hudson's Bay Company and the Old Nor'westers. And in 1870, under the direction of Louis Riel, Red River became the province of Manitoba. Winnipeg, the capital of Manitoba, has been called an old city in a new country and I was pleased to discover that her turn-of-the-century architecture had not been torn down in favor of malls and parking lots. All transportation, trade and immigration passed through Winnipeg, so it saw for itself a, a future as the Chicago of the North. One of the jewels, architecturally speaking, is what's known as the Exchange District. This would have been essentially the first downtown of Winnipeg. In the 1880s, land at the corner of Portage and Maine were fetching the same prices that a square foot of land were costing in New York City. St. Boniface itself has a number of very interesting structures as well. 
the St. Boniface Museum, for instance, is the only remnant other than the Fort Garry Gate of the Red River period. It's the largest oak log building in North America. It's been a national historic site since 1958. But of course, the real jewel in the crown in St. Boniface is the cathedral and the basilica ruins. The basilica, of course, was an outstanding architectural treasure. Unfortunately, it was destroyed by fire in 1968. But the success that the architect achieved in melding the old exterior with the modern cathedral, I think it is just marvelous. Saskatchewan was part of the Prairie Last Best West campaign, an aggressive advertising scheme to attract European homesteaders to the West. The campaign was a resounding success. From the turn of the century until 1914, Three million people from all over the world, including Ukrainians, Mennonites, Czechs, Germans, Poles, and Dutch, came to the prairies for 160 acres of free land, her family. While two-thirds of Saskatchewan is prairie lowland, there are also thriving modern cities and a surprising diversity of landscapes. Just outside of Saskatoon is Wanuskewan, where you can meet and watch archaeologists at work on a project that's been causing excitement since the 1930s. Uh, the archaeologists that first arrived here in the 3032 were looking at the very readily visible sites, such as the Medicine Wheel site, the teepee rings. It wasn't until later they started to investigate the valley and such that uh, things were eroding out of the creek banks, such as bones and pottery. People have been using this valley for um, just about 6,000 years and using it as a hunting area, a place to procure bison, uh, berries, and things like that. Plains Cree tradition was an oral tradition, so all these things were passed down uh, through uh, storytelling from elders and on to younger people. I think it's hard to, for people to imagine that it hasn't been written down, these things, you know, even though 6,000 years old, we're not going to find any clay tablets or anything like that out here. towns in Saskatchewan are having a difficult time. We're fortunate we have a resource. It's the nationally significant history that's here. We borrowed the idea from Chimanus on Vancouver Island. From 1882 to 1920, Regina was the headquarters for the RCMP, and Moose Jaw is home to the world-famous flying squadron, the Snowbirds. The dream of a Métis state in the prairies ended here in Saskatchewan on May the 12th, 1885, at the Battle of Batoche. A year before, Louis Riel petitioned Ottawa requesting Métis land rights and better conditions for the Indian bands who were on the brink of starvation. Petition denied, Riel established a provisional government with Gabriel Dumont as commander-in-chief. An army was sent to quell the insurrection and Batoche was captured in a four-day siege. Riel, despite opposition, was hanged for treason. Indian leaders Big Bear and Poundmaker were jailed and died shortly after their release from prison. Dumont escaped to the States, where he joined Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. Granted amnesty, he returned to Batoche, where he died in 1906. Alberta conjures up images of cowboys and rodeos, oil wells and ranches, 
but this 70 million year old graveyard is also part of Alberta. The badlands of this park are a dry, convoluted lunar landscape, but it wasn't always like this. At one time, the Gulf of Mexico reached this far. The area was a jungle-like swamp, and dinosaurs loved it. Dinosaur Provincial Park contains one of the world's richest deposits of fossils. By car and walking trails, you can explore the spectacular but fragile terrain and view dinosaur skeletons in the exact spot they were discovered. I'm standing at the top of Head Smashed In Buffalo Jump near Fort McLeod in Alberta. Before the advent of firearms, the Blackfoot Indians used to kill the buffalo by driving the thundering herds over these steep cliffs. This buffalo jump was in use about the same time or before the pyramids were getting built over on the other side of the world. Before the horse was even introduced to the Blackfeet Nation tribe, what they call imitatas, dog team days. Every year, in about this time of the fall, is when they use this buffalo jump. If you take all the roads and the buildings and the fences all off out of here, and you put 60 million buffalo out there, roaming at one time, buffalo. Hey, that one guy, old guy was talking about, if you were gonna go across country here, and that buffalo just happened to be going by, you'd have to sit and wait three days and three nights just for a herd just to pass by. The romance and lure of the Old West entices even the slickest city slicker to straddle the saddle. Uh, we found that there's quite a demand in Calgary, people who want to learn more about horses and learn to ride. You see a person who starts out uh, being a little bit fearful and you're dealing with a thousand pounds of twisted steel there and then they get used to the horse and, and their learning curve goes up very rapidly and then it becomes a very important part to, to them. They've overcome something in many cases. It's sunrise at Lake Louise in the Rocky Mountains of Alberta. This whole area was once covered by a vast inland sea and underwent dramatic geologic changes some 70 million years ago when these mountains emerged like crinkling blankets out of an ancient sea. Shrouded in fog, this 11-kilometer crescent of hard-packed white sand is Long Beach in the Pacific Rim National Park on the west coast of British Columbia's Vancouver Island. When the mist lifts, beachcombers browse through the refuse cast up by the sea.
part of the Long Beach unit of the Pacific Rim Park are two hiking trails, the Rainforest Trail and the Shore Pine Bog. Here on the Shore Pine Bog Trail, we see uh, trees that are mostly shore pines. And because of the high water table and extremely acidic conditions, it grows in an unusual form. The trees are dwarfed, and if they're rounded clump tops, they look like uh, large cauliflowers. Some of them might be up to 500 years old, and yet they stand only about five to six meters tall. On the uh, ground level, we see a variety of smaller plants, such as the sundew, which is a, an, an insect-eating plant. The giant of the rainforest is the western red cedar. It's a tree that, in places, is, uh, oh, well, it's over 20 meters around. And it uh, makes it one of the giants of the, of the world's uh, forest trees. Pacific Rim National Park is one place where this forest type that we've been talking about will be preserved. That's very important because so much of uh, the coast of British Columbia is, is given over to uh, forest harvesting. This will represent a forest that has been here for several thousand years and will continue to be here for thousands of years more. Another unit of the Pacific Rim Park is the Broken Group, an archipelago of more than 100 islands. The largest is uh, less than a square mile in area. The smallest uh, might be just a few, uh, few trees atop a small rocky knoll that protrudes from the water. The Barclay Sound area, of which the Broken Group is part, it has one of the highest bald eagle concentrations in North America. All units of the park have sea lions in it. They're a fascinating animal with uh, fascinating sounds and, a, and quite a, an interesting smell associated with them. The Queen Charlotte Islands, Haida Gwaii, are the only part of Canada which escaped the last ice age. The landscape is a remarkable rugged wilderness, including 1,000-year-old tracts of rainforest, which the Haida have strived to protect from further logging. The Haida, who have lived on these islands for the last 10,000 years, were almost wiped out in the 19th century by European diseases. And traditional villages like Skadance were abandoned 100 years ago. As the earth continues to reclaim Skadance, soon only an archaeologist will be able to find evidence of this once complex and thriving community. To see the greatest collection of Indian carvings in the world, we return to the mainland of British Columbia and the Museum of Anthropology. Then we took in the sights and sounds of one of Bruno Gerussi's favorite cities, Vancouver. Ah, well, the ocean is here and the mountains are there and you can go skiing at Whistler and Blackcomb and, and in the summer now, it's a first-class summer resort area. The Yukon and Northwest Territories combined represent 40% of Canada's land mass. I'm standing in the world's largest non-polar ice field in the St. Elias mountain range in Kluane National Park. And behind me is Mount Logan at nearly 20,000 feet, the largest mountain in Canada. And this is the Yukon. Few people who come to Kluani make it this far into the park. The rugged terrain means flying is the best option. 
and our pilot and guide was Andrew Williams. We've just landed on the Seward Glacier. It's one of the larger ice fields in, in the complex. On each side of us are some of the higher mountains of the range. We've got uh, Mount St. Elias, which is the second highest, just over 18,000 feet. And alongside of that is uh, Mount Augusta, Mount Cook, Mount Vancouver, and then dominating us at the present is uh, Mount Logan, which is the most climbed mountain in this particular range, but in fact it doesn't get many ascents over, uh, over the course of the years. Uh, the attraction of it, of course, is being the highest mountain in Canada, but it's also extremely challenging for a mountaineer from a technical standpoint. We are flying across the center of the range, and uh, we're going to leave the range by following the Cascoise Glacier down to the Slims River Valley. The Cascoise Glacier is one of the larger glaciers it's uh, up to 50 kilometers long, and uh, although it doesn't seem to be, it's, uh, it's five kilometers wide. And uh, it has these very striking moraine patterns, which uh, have made it a very popular mountain for photographers. Kluwani, along with adjacent uh, Wrangell St. Elias National Park in Alaska, were jointly nominated to the United Nations uh, list of World Heritage Sites in 1979. We're uh, just north of the 60th parallel, which is the border between the provinces and the territories. And um, if we were at the same latitude further east in Canada, we'd be well above tree line into very subarctic or arctic conditions. But here, because of the Pacific climate, which is uh, salt water only being 100 miles away, we have the northernmost range of a lot of Pacific plant species and southern animal species. The most notable species is doll sheep. And there's about uh, 5,000 doll sheep in the park. The Slims River Valley is notorious for bears. And we have about uh, one grizzly bear for every 10 square miles of habitat. Haines Junction is the headquarters for Kluwani National Park and the junction of the Haines and Alaska highways. 1992 marks the 50th anniversary of the Alaska Highway, which was built as a supply road to World War II bases in Alaska. The construction of the highway opened up the area, permanently changing the lives of the Aboriginal peoples. But, as we discovered, some of the ancient traditions live on. We, as a people, have been, are known as nomadic people and uh, they weren't nomadic by choice. They had to follow wherever the game was, wherever the, the food, their berries, or, um, the fish were. And down at Kluxu is one of the main rivers where the salmon come back up uh, through the Alsac. Oh, yeah. A lot of our elders, they, they don't have any kind of thing written down, but they have everything up in their, up in their mind. And uh, the map of this country is up here. The knowledge of, of uh, all our stories and um, all our history, going back generation, 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 is all up in here. From 1896 to 1904, the Klondike Gold Rush brought thousands of fortune seekers, predominantly Americans, to the Yukon. Boom towns, including Dawson City and Whitehorse, sprang up overnight as more than $100 million in gold was mined. As the capital and commercial center of the Yukon, Whitehorse continues to prosper. The final stage of our journey took us into one of the most challenging environments known to man, the Northwest Territories. It's the general assumption that when Europeans braved the Atlantic in the 15th century and landed in the New World, they found that it was occupied very sparsely, a little very sparse scattering of people living in a very low level of technology and low level of culture. And from what the uh, demographers are able to put together now, there may have been roughly 100 million uh, Aboriginal people in the New World, concentrated in the uh, very high civilization areas of Mexico, uh, the Caribbean. Even to the north of that, in what is now uh, the United States and Canada, they calculate there may have been roughly 20 million people. 
20 million people, comparable to the European population of that time, easily able to repel invaders. In fact, 100 years after Columbus, there was not a single European colony north of the Spanish areas of Mexico. Then, in 1604, the Europeans were able to establish permanent settlements. The only reason that we can explain this is massive depopulation of the Aboriginal peoples. Demographers can calculate now something between 90% uh, and 95% of New World populations died as a result of European diseases. In the 1600s, it was the people of the Maritimes who died off. By the late 1700s, 90% of the Chippewaian up west of Hudson Bay died. The last one would have been the Inuvialuit people of the Mackenzie Delta. 90% of them died in 1902 from measles. Remarkably, the Inuit survived, and today the territories are the only region in Canada where the Aboriginal peoples, the Dene, Métis, and the Inuit, represent the majority of the population. Every community in the eastern Arctic, with the exception of Pele Bay, relies on a summer sea lift. The sea is covered with ice uh, for a number of months of the year, so we can't get ships in here year-round. Uh, ships come in, in to Iqaluit in late July. Airplanes bring in a good number of products, but the residents of Iqaluit on Baffin Island still depend on the sea lift to deliver construction materials, trucks, fuel, furniture and food. Inuit are relying more and more on southern products such as ammunition, canvas, tents, canoes. You rely on it in winter time because the more you rely on modern stuff, the more you need it. So um, this way it's very important because you get the most practical things that you need and the most basic necessities such as flour, tea and, and biscuits like that. Being an animal lover, when I arrived in Yellowknife, I wanted to meet Bill Carpenter who has been instrumental in preserving the dog breed, known as Kimmick. Once indispensable to the Inuit way of life, snowmobiles and airplanes threaten to make the breed obsolete. With the assistance of the Inuvaluit, Bill Carpenter and partner John McGraw established a breeding program. The origin is with the Thule culture when the migration of Inuit occurred from um, Siberia all across northern Canada over as far as Greenland. They were a working dog that pulled sleds, carried uh, packs, and they were used for hunting uh, to locate seal breathing holes, to uh, defend against polar bear, or to even aggressively attack uh, musk oxen or, or caribou. Puppies born in the spring are almost mature size by four and a half months, and it fits then with all of the northern breeds of animals which have a rapid growth rate in preparation for early winters and severe winters. What you're looking at now is the instinctive behavior as, as young puppies. If they can hide and protect themselves from either wolves or bears, um, they're survivors. There's no doubt about it. You have to be tough to survive in the North. Back in 1938, in the midst of the Great Depression, gold was discovered in Yellowknife. Mary Forrest's husband, Tom, landed a job as a mining cook, and they literally had to rough it in the bush. Ralph Cross took me on a tour through the old town, if you call 50 years old. And Shorty Brown, a former hockey star turned real estate developer, introduced me to the modern town. Of course, I had to meet with the prospector who holds the claim to the oldest known rock in the world, officially dated at 3.962 billion years. But he turned out to be an artist and philosopher. Well, you have to have a sense of humor to survive in the north, that's what helps. But all in the bush, people are people, and you treat them by how good they are as a trapper, or as a prospector, or how conscious they are of animals, of other people's uh, rights to the land. So the north is one of those places that you, you fall in love with, or you, you hate it. <laughs> my trip across Canada dispelled a number of my beliefs. North America was not discovered by Columbus, nor was it an empty continent 500 years ago. We may be a young nation, but the history of our native peoples goes back at least 20,000 years. While our ancestors lived in the wilderness, today most Canadians are urban dwellers concentrated in a 100-mile strip along the American border. And because people from all over the world decided to make Canada their home, we can draw strength from a multitude of traditions and cultures. 
we have all the potential to be a key member of the global village in the 21st century. As we traveled across the country by plane, train and car, I began to have a greater appreciation of the explorers who made their way through tangled forests, the settlers who survived prairie winters, and our native peoples who have so much to teach us about living with and not against nature. We take so much for granted and live such a fast-paced life that we rarely stop to experience our surroundings or appreciate the variety of peoples, cultures and landscapes. If I have only one wish for this country, it is that everyone should have the opportunity and the time to travel across and experience Canada. I'm Anne Martin and I'll see you again next time on Top of the World. You are the brightness of the sunshine that lights up my room. You are the warmth of the water that washes me each day. You are the strength that fills me when my weakness overflows. You are the comfort of a soothing word. This program has been selected by Canada 125 as part of Canada's official anniversary celebrations and was made possible by Eaton's, Canada's department store since 1869, Confederation Life, serving people's financial needs since 1871, and Knob Hill Farms, the food terminal, a proud Canadian company. A video copy of this program is available at all Eaton stores across Canada made possible with the generous participation of NCR and more business forms. If you would like to follow in our footsteps, the following travel guide has been provided to help you plan your Canadian vacation. The categories are transportation, accommodation, and tourism toll-free telephone numbers for every province and territory. Airline transportation was provided by Canadian Airlines. Canadian Airlines and its regional airline network currently fly to more international and domestic destinations than any other Canadian carrier and operate one of the youngest jet fleets in North America. Canadian partners include Intercanadien, Air Saint-Pierre, Air Atlantic, Carmair, Time Air and Canadian North. Contact your travel agent for further information. Train service is available coast to coast on Via Rail. For further information, contact your local Via Rail office or your travel agent. Additional transportation was provided by Tundra Buggy Tours, Churchill, Manitoba. 
Vancouver Island Helicopters, Sandspit, Queen Charlotte Islands, Raven Tours, Yellowknife, Northwest Territories, Icefield Ranges Expeditions, Kluwani Lake Research Station, Yukon, and Canadian Princess, Oak Bay Marine Group, Ukrulet, British Columbia. Accommodation was provided by Holiday Inn and Holiday Inn Crown Plaza. Additional accommodation was provided by the following hotels. For specific information on every province and territory in Canada, please call these tourism toll-free telephone numbers, valid for Canada and the United States, unless otherwise indicated.